I need you for a moment to put yourselves into the shoes of the disciples. You have had an incredibly busy week, beginning with that surprise red carpet parade back there on Sunday, that parade into Jerusalem. And ever since arriving at Jerusalem, Jesus has been challenging the authorities. He exploded in righteous anger at the money changers and dump sellers overturning their uh, tables. And his teachings have become much more urgent and hard this week. And he's been debating with the chief priests on matters of tax and resurrection and Jewish law. And then he accused the scholars of being pompous show-offs and of secretly exploiting widows. All of this is making you feel um, rather embarrassed and uncomfortable and rather frustrated. Why won't this man just be the Messiah and overrule the Romans and get justice for the Jewish people? You're also rather frightened. You can feel that tension mounting and mounting among the religious leaders. The atmosphere is starting to become explosive. Why so much confrontation? Most distressing of all, Jesus keeps warning you that the end is near, that he is going to suffer, that you are going to suffer, that there's going to be a time that you feel that your whole world is going to come crumbling down all around you. He's told you, stay awake. Be alert to the coming crisis. Now it is Thursday. You're tired, you're plumb worn out from the stress of the whole week, and you're full. You've just enjoyed a Passover Seder meal that not only took all day to cook, but took several hours to eat. It is very, very late. You followed Jesus to the Olive Garden to pray. Now, you've prayed here many times before. But tonight, Jesus says, I feel bad enough right now that I could die. Please stay in vigil. Pray with me. The warm summer night ruffles your hair, silent. Even the birds are asleep. This is a familiar, calm, relaxing place. You've been here many times before. You've been here so often, the olive trees feel like friends. Your eyes are heavy. Oh, so heavy. And you sleep. You succumbed to the temptation of sleep. You've let a true friend down. He only asked for one hour of prayer, and you slept. You couldn't even give him that, not even one hour. And he comes, and he wakes you up again, and he says, watch, pray, don't fall temptation of sleep. I know your spirit is willing and your body is weak. Pray with me. He asks, you. He needs you. And you fall asleep again. Incredibly, three times Jesus asks for prayers and three times you give in to the temptation of sleep. Temptation is so much easier to resist when all is going well and we're well rested. But when stress and fatigue and worry and loneliness and trauma and drama start to pile up on us, that is so much easier to be persuaded by temptation. When we get tired out on our journey, we are more susceptible to the whispers of wickedness 
that will bring momentary pleasure and long-term pain. For example, when I get home after a church meeting and Frank is already asleep, cookies and ice cream call to me. I don't need any more food, but they call. They offer a reward for a job well done. They offered comfort and solace in the silence of the night. Or think of that really hard-working parent balancing a busy family knife, life and the pressure of holding on to a job in the economy where even when you work hard, your job is not secure. You have spent yourself at work and you come home to a tired spouse who's also been working and cranky kids. Children have to be fed and homework has to be supervised. Housework is piling up and boy, oh boy, wouldn't a beer be great now? A beer or two or three or if not beer or a glass of wine. What about the drone of TV to numb our tired, aching souls? <coughs> Consider the lonely business person traveling far, far from home, the once daily phone call, their only connection to love. How easy would it be to surrender to the computer's lure of pornography? After all, no one's going to ever know that you escaped for a while into a fantasy land. When we are physically and emotionally and spiritually depleted, where do we turn to refuel? For many, God is the last resort after taking all the other painkillers in life, like alcohol and excess work and pornography or an affair or prescription drugs or gambling. In Mark, the disciples are painted in dark hues to show how broken humankind can be. They fall asleep despite Jesus' anguish. And that sleep represents more than just the fatigue and a big dinner. That brand of sleep can be deadly. It represents a spiritual topper of those who do not recognize the moment of crisis is near and don't prepare themselves to face it. When the crisis of Jesus' arrest came, the disciples were unprepared. Jesus stood there strong, but the disciples ran away. One even ran away naked, leaving his dignity behind. Jesus' play, pray, Jesus' plea, could you not stay awake, is the church's uncomfortable reminder that we too sometimes fall into the numb slumber in the face of the world's pain. You know, Jesus is suffering within the terrified minds of those living in war-torn countries. He's suffering within the bodies of the hungry and the homeless. He's suffering in our neighbors who are spiritually lost and lonely. Temptation is twofold. It is the personal sin that distracts us from God and God's plan for us. But it is also the communal neglect, the group hard-heartedness, the collective ignorance, a persistent yielding to slumber that induces us to turn from crisis. Folks, we are tempted simply to give up. The United Methodist Committee on Relief, known as UMCOR, is one way of staying awake. It's one way that we as the church serve the hungry, the homeless, the lost, and the lonely. When there's a natural disaster like the recent tornadoes in the Midwest, or the severe drought in the Horn of Africa last fall, the humanitarian arm of the United Methodist Church reaches out immediately with personnel and supplies to bring relief. But then, after the adrenaline rush is gone and the news reporters have gone home, they stay in a second round of helping people rebuild their lives. 
So when if you go to read about UMCOR on the internet, you will find stories about tornadoes and floods and earthquakes, but you'll also read about clean water in Nicaragua or ongoing projects in New Orleans and Haiti or how they took school supplies for the children in remote Matumba, Zimbabwe. When you make a donation to UMCOR projects, all the money, every single penny, goes for those projects. None of it goes for administration. Today is the one and only time that the United Methodists uh, ask for help with the administrative costs. <clears throat> today we celebrate one great hour of sharing, and today's donations will be used to cover those administrative costs. While there are many volunteers like Beth Ann, Beth Ann is going to Haiti <coughs> at the end of this month, there's also a need for specially trained and highly skilled employees that will make sure that when disaster hits, the right people get to the right place immediately. And that's what today's collection is about. Every dollar that you're going to slip into that little special envelope will be used carefully to continue for us to be alert and responsive to suffering all around the globe. We won't sleep in the face of anguish. Mark contrasts the disciples with Jesus. While the disciples fall asleep in the face of suffering, Jesus turns to God. A very human Jesus who is distressed and agitated and deeply grieved turns to Abba, his father, his daddy. He isn't calling on a remote God somewhere up there. He's pouring out his heart to a tender parent, someone who he can count on to listen, to do what is best, someone who will respond to his needs in love. This prayer is both one of fervent supplication. He's face down on the ground asking the one who could change the outcome to remove this cup of suffering. It is also a prayer of reverent submission. Not my will, but yours. Not what I want, but what you want for the world, God. I connect with this prayer. I think that Jesus' prayer is the heart of the Gethsemane story. We all know that God can do all things, and that all things are possible with God, and yet in the midst of our suffering, or in the midst of suffering of others, we pray for God to take it away. To heal us. To heal our little ones. To give us work. To give others food. To take away that black hole in our life. To take away the poison in the life of a loved one. And then we move to a deeper level in our soul. We pray to accept God's will for our lives. Even if God's plan is different than our plan, even if God's timing is different than our timing, the Spirit of Christ slowly begins to work in our hearts, and then finally we can come to that point and confess, I accept your will for my life. It happens to all of us at some point in our life. Although Mark paints the disciples in dark hues, laying bare all of their foibles, at the same time, he reveals to us an unusual amount of grace, unconditional grace. For example, even though that Jesus knows that his disciples are going to betray, deny, and abandon him, he gathers those same people for one more supper in which he can show them his love by washing their feet and tell them one more important thing, give them rituals to remember their time together by. Peter, 
who can't stay awake to pray with Jesus. Peter, who's going to deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times in the next, within the next 24 hours. He has a special message for Peter. He singled, Peter is singled out by the angel at the empty tomb. The angel says, tell the disciples and Peter that Christ has gone ahead and will meet up with them in Galilee. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane in anguish because he knew what lay ahead. He knew that he would experience the physical pain of torture and the emotional pain of humiliation. He knew that he would have to face all that pain without the support of his 12 disciples. He would have worried that he, he may have worried that he'd be misunderstood, seen as weak and powerless, that people would turn away from the route that he had already mapped out, a route of operating in love even in the face of hate. And some people would want and wait for a better Messiah, a different Messiah, for the Messiah, and not grasp on to the salvation that he was already offering. And yet he chose to gather up the strength of the Holy Spirit by praying to God, and he did not turn from the plotted route. If we ever give in to temptation and doubt that there is grace and forgiveness for us, we need to remember this moment, a time when anguish and hope meet, where Jesus went to the cross to heal the brokenness of his disciples, to heal the brokenness of the crowds that are around him. He went to the cross even for those that were killing him. His radical example of love, renouncing violence, it did something. It does something. It secures our release from all earthly powers, including those of temptation, and offers us a connection to God and the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave himself so that we would find hope in his resurrection. He gave himself so that we could always turn to God, to live in Christ's love and thrive with a life-giving spirit. God is not looking for perfect people. God works through all of us at each stage of our discipleship. He just needs us to be awake. When times are hard and we become depleted, we can turn to God in prayer and become restored. And through prayer, we will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit for the whole journey ahead. Jesus has blazed that trail of hope for us. We just need to follow. Amen. Amen.